Well, good morning and welcome to Vintage Church. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Steve Smotherman Jr. Um, I'm on staff with my dad, Steve Smotherman Sr. at Legacy Church in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. He's been out here several times, uh, great friends with Pastor Stephen, and so he invited me out this weekend um, to speak, and then I did a mental performance workshop yesterday, so I'm a pastor and a sports psychologist, and so I work with uh, different professional athletes, college athletes, even youth athletes on mental performance, not mental health, but mental performance, helping them to perform uh, in the moment and learn how to do all of that. And so that's what I do. So I did a workshop yesterday. Uh, I was out here last September and did a one-day mental seminar and then preached at the Belting Campus. So today I'm with you all. You're stuck with me and I don't feel bad for you because it's going to be great. Um, But uh, can we give it up for our senior pastors, Pastor Stephen and Dr. Kyla Martin? They're just incredible (laughs) gifts from God to us and for us and for this area this community. I tell everyone seriously, though, that uh, Pastor Stephen, over the last several years, has really become one of my closest friends in life. Um, He's definitely a friend that I call uh, when I'm going through stuff, and I say, hey, man, here's what's going on. And he uh, tells me the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, he's my friend, so he helps me. Um, And then he says, maybe you're not seeing this, or maybe you're seeing this. And uh, so I just want you to know that you guys, I believe, personally, just as his friend, that we are in great hands at this church. Well, I know we're in a series called Mixed Emotions, and so I'm going to preach uh, within that series. Uh, The tagline on it, right, is how to deal with what you feel. And today we're going to talk about changing how you feel. So it's kind of a perfect setup for a mental performance guy to talk about changing feelings. And the reason is because first I need us to understand before I start that feelings aren't facts, Just because I feel something doesn't mean it's factual, right? Because one, feelings change. And you've probably been there, and I've been there, right? You you think somebody's, you feel like they're doing something or they're saying something or this is going on. and, And maybe going into the conversation, you think all this, and then you have the conversation, and it's nothing like what you felt. Anybody ever been there? Sometimes it's everything and more than what you felt, but I I tell people this all the time, especially with the athletes, and because their feeling sometimes is I suck at this sport all of a sudden, and I'm terrible, and I'm like, is that actually fact, or is it just you feel that way? Most of the time, it's they feel that way. You're not as bad as what you're feeling, and, and, and oftentimes our feelings lie to us, but as people, we have to learn to not allow our feelings to dictate our actions, because we're not animals. Animals react, humans respond, right? Animals don't have a choice. They react. You step on a snake, it bites you. You you do certain things and they react to it. But humans are unique because we have a responsibility or a response ability that animals don't have. I use an equation, E plus R equals O, event plus response equals outcome. Now, you and I don't have a lot of control over the events that happen to us, right? Like, Things happen, people say stuff, bosses happen, employees happen, other humans happen, the person you look at in the mirror happens. We don't have a lot of control sometimes over the events. We definitely have zero control over the outcome, but that's what stresses us out when we're focused on the outcome. The outcome is what produces stress. I need it to be this. Or uh, when I talk to athletes, I say, quit looking at the scoreboard because what does a scoreboard produce? Stress. I have to make this play. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to. I have to. And that that puts pressure and anxieties that don't need to be there. So we don't have control over the events or the outcome, but we have full control and responsibility over the R, which is our response. I get to choose based off of whatever happens to me, whatever you say to me, however you look at me, however you treat me, I get to choose how I respond to that. Unless you're going to tell me you're an animal, which last time I checked, we're all human beings in here, you get to choose. You say, well, I acted this way because she did this. No, you acted that way because you chose to act that way. Well, she, 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 or he's, he didn't do this, so this is why I don't do this for him, and this is why I don't do that. It's not because of him, sweetheart. It's because of you. You chose it. 
You chose your response. He didn't make you do it. Because you hear people all the time, well, they made me. Well, did they really? Like, unless they had a gun to your head, they did not make you. They made me do this. No, they said something that you didn't like, and your feelings got hurt, and then you chose to respond. That's what that is. So we have to get to a place where we learn to work on and take awareness of and take responsibility of our feelings and not allow our feelings to dictate our future, but allow our actions to dictate our future. Because here's what I know. God is much more concerned about who you're becoming than how you feel. God calls us to grow, calls us to do some things without reference to whether or not he cares how you feel about it. He didn't say, hey, in the book of Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of the brethren. He doesn't care if you feel like coming to church. He said, go to church. He didn't say whether you feel like it or not, go. He said, no, go. He he didn't ask how I felt. When he, when, he, when he called me to, to pastor to do this, he didn't ask how I felt about it, because if he would have asked, I would have said no. I'm a preacher's kid. I absolutely wanted nothing to do with church. I like loved Jesus, but I didn't like this. And God had to do it, because I'm not the preacher's kid who was like, I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps. I was the one that was like, no, never. And then God's like, gotcha. I gave you one gift, dude, in this public speaking. I <laughs> deal with it. I'm a one-trick pony. That's all I got. So if you don't like it today, I really suck at what I do. But I don't care if you like it or not. That's the problem. You know, I don't care because if I care, I mean, I care. Yes, I care that you do something with it. But when I first started preaching, I would, I would stress out over if anybody did anything or responded. I'd be like, man, are they, are they doing anything with what I'm preaching? Da, 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 da. You know what that is? That's an outcome that I have no control over. Because at the end of the day, what you do with what I preach today isn't my job. My job was to prepare, to deliver, to preach the message of of, of what we're going to talk about in the Word. That's my job. What you do with it has nothing to do with me. Well, if my preacher would preach different messages, what? If if, if the church would do this, when, when did God say in his Word that it's everybody else's responsibility, your relationship with him? Did he say that at any point? All right, that's good. I'm going to preach that then. Okay. But at any point, did he say that? Whose job is it to build a relationship with Jesus? It's not my job to build yours. My job is to deliver a message to create a place or a space or an environment for Christians to get around each other, which is messy and it's not fun sometimes. Can be fun, but they're still humans. Because I think sometimes we have an expectation that, oh, because they're Christians, they're not going to be such and such and such. Listen. They're still humans. It doesn't make them hypocrites. Maybe this, this thought right here is for someone that hasn't been in a while because Christians are all hypocrites. No, they're not. They're human beings. They're human beings who have oopses, accidents, mistakes, some intentional, some unintentional. I've sinned unintentionally sometimes. You ever been there? I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to do what's right. And then it just happened. And you, you look and you're like, I don't even know why I did it. Anybody been there? I'm going to tell you why you did it. It was because of thoughts. And we're going to get into that. The Bible tells us this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, don't copy the the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So here's what we need to know. TBT, thoughts become things. What we think about is what we become. It's what we begin to act on. It's, it's, It's how God, the Bible says, how does God transform us into a new person? It tells us by how we think. And there's a responsibility on us, on on our thoughts. It says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And I already said this, but God is more interested in who you're becoming than how you feel. So let me give you some thoughts on why we must manage our mind. Number one is because my thoughts control my life. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says this, be careful how you think your life is what? Shaped by your thoughts. Thoughts become things. What we think about the most is what we're going to get. Why? Because our focus determines our future. You're going to get what you see and what you think about. If this is all I'm thinking about, listen, if you're in your marriage and all you're thinking about is how bad it is, guess what it's going to be? 
If all you think about when you're thinking about your kids is how bad they are and this and this and this, guess what you're going to get? If all you think is my job sucks and my life sucks, guess what? Your life sucks. (laughs) And it's not anybody else's fault but mine. I know we blame our parents because that's what every generation does. Good, bad, or not, it's my parents' fault. All the parents in the room are like, yeah, see? All the older grandparents, you blamed yours too. Because can I tell you, those of you that have kids my age, like mine are 10, uh, 10, 7, and 3, they're going to blame me too. No matter how good I could be or how bad, they're going to say, well, my daddy didn't do this and he did this. And and I think what I'm doing is right because I don't freaking know what I'm doing. (laughs) Be leery of the people who always want to tell you how to parent your kids because they don't actually know. I hate it. Like every, I, I'm around so many Christians that like, oh, I want to do a thing for parents exactly on how to parent their kids. And I'm like, your kids are my kids' age. And, and some of them, they, they do have older adult kids. And I'm like, you kind of did get a little lucky. Because I've seen phenomenal parents, people that you'd look at and, you'd, and, and when they tell you the things they did, I'm like, dang, that's really good. Like, I feel bad that I didn't do that. And their kids are the devil. <laughs> but they did awesome stuff. I mean, they had like Bible studies and devotion times and stuff that I'm like, dang, and their kids still jacked up. (laughs) And then I've seen parents that I'm like, you are terrible and your kid's amazing. (laughs) Some of you are that (laughs) on either side. Like I did bad things in my high school and early college years. And I, I honestly, when I look back, I had great parents. It wasn't a reflection of their parenting why I did what I did. I did it because I chose to. And I could blame everybody else. Well, people put pressure on me because I was a preacher's kid. Freaking who cares? I chose to do it. I'm a grown man. It was my decision. Quit blaming everybody else for your problems. 99.9% of the ones that you're looking at in the mirror. If your marriage isn't good, maybe they've done some things, but have you done everything you can? Have you been the best? Because if we're going to break it down, you haven't been the best wife and you haven't been the best husband. Because last time I checked, if we're going to compare it to what is the best, that's our Father in heaven. And the Bible says that our own righteousness is but filthy rags unto God. So no matter how good you think you are unto God in comparison to what we really compare it against, because usually we're just comparing against what they're doing or not doing. And God didn't ask you to be a good husband if your wife does everything perfect. He didn't ask you to respect women in the room. <laughs> they didn't, God did not say respect your husband only if you feel like he deserves it. <laughs> You're supposed to give that whether he deserves it according to you or not. Because last time I checked, Jesus gave you undeserved grace. Yeah. Sorry, but I'm not. Because <laughs> if you don't like me, I won't be here next week, so I don't really care. <laughs> And you'll get out of your fills and you'll get over it and you'll be like, dang, it's, he's right. The Bible doesn't say that if everything else works out perfect, then I can operate. This is what I do with athletes. I tell them all the time, I don't know if I'm supposed to stand on these things, but it's cool. It's like a platform. And I like to get, you know, whatever. They're sturdy. I haven't fallen. Everyone's, every time I take a step, they're like, whoo. I'm semi-athletic, and then I'm going to fall and be like, my kids, anytime they do something, I'm like, just be an athlete. Cut it out. Anyway, okay. But I tell athletes, there's some baseball players I work with. I was talking to a, a guy. He, he, he was a, a, a middle infielder, and when we were talking, we were talking about some of the struggles he had. And some of the struggles hitting the ball that he was having was after the first pitch, and he thought it was a ball, call it a strike, whatever, wasn't seeing the ball well, and he was complaining to me. Man, the umpires aren't giving me the calls. Nothing's, you know, working out. And I said this to him. I said, do you suck that bad at baseball that everything has to be perfect for you to get a hit? He was like, well, no. I said, well, everything you're telling me tells me that. You're telling me everybody else and everything else has to go perfectly your way for you to operate. Last time I checked, we don't need that. Last time I checked, you don't suck that bad that everything has to be perfect for you to operate. Because if you do, then you should quit playing the sport you're playing. Because last time I checked, you know how to hit a baseball. 
Last time I checked, you know how to hit a golf ball. Last time I checked, you know how to be a man. Last time I checked, you know how to be a woman. And if you say, I don't know how, well, get in the word of God and it'll teach you how. Well, I didn't have an example of it. That's not an excuse. Or my example was too much or they were too overbearing or because we've been there too. My parents were too controlling and so now I'm just freed up. Looking like a bunch of William Wallace is running around. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, he died. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> I have a William Wallace, actually. It's on my driver from my golf. It's a William Wallace head cover, and it's like, freedom. I was talking to Pastor Stephen and Matt about it, and it's like, you know, he, he still died. <laughs> freedom! Dead. Okay, anyway. That's so bad. Okay, back to the sermon. (laughs) Number one, my thoughts control my life. Number two, why we've got to manage our minds is that the mind is the battleground for sin. All sin starts in what we think about. You say, well, if this wasn't in front of me or if I didn't see this or I didn't come across this, I wouldn't have had those thoughts and I wouldn't have been tempted. Listen, temptation, there's already an innate desire in us for that thing. So all that thing did was create a thought. And then we have to make a decision what we do with that thought. We can't control the thoughts that come in our brain. We get crazy thoughts. Anybody ever had a crazy thought in here? Listen, here's the deal. I bet every single one of us has been cut off in traffic and the thought you had would put you in prison for the rest of your life. Because your thought wasn't Princess Poppy from Trolls. Oh, it's a good day. They just cut me off. I just love you, bless you. It was like, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) Some of us even sent birdies at them. Signals. It's not the Princess Poppy birds either. (laughs) Listen, if we could have a big thought bubble in here. Some of y'all, how many of you have ever been in church and you had a crazy thought? A bunch of people lying. I've had crazy thoughts while I'm preaching. <laughs> I'm like, what the? Like, y'all, y'all don't know. I've had thoughts while preaching like, that's weird. Why am I thinking that? Steve, get back on the sermon. It's just, it happens. But we have to take those thoughts. The Bible says take them captive. We have to be intentional with our thought life. If we leave it to chance, we're going to lose the battle. Listen, in order to win the battleground of the mind, first we have to know that we're in a battle. If you don't know you're fighting, you can't prepare and strategize and win. Army people in the room. You have to know you're in a fight to engage in the fight. People that are married. You ever been blindsided by a fight? You didn't know. (laughs) All of a sudden, you're like, dang, she turned up. And and like, we in a fight. What happened? My wife's half Dominican, half Panamanian. She's amazing. But you know, sometimes... Call it my little Dominican firecracker. It just happens. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Christians don't fight. We have intense fellowship. I forgot. Okay. We don't fight. Yeah, you do. You argue. From the car to church service, you argue sometimes. You did this morning. I'm just loose this third service. I don't even care. Whatever. We're just going to have some fun. But sometimes it happens. But you got to know you're in a fight if you want to engage in the fight. And then we got to get a strategy and a plan. Because it's dumb to go into a fight with no strategy or no plan. You can't just just wing it. You can't just shoot from the hip. It doesn't work. It only works in movies. It doesn't work in actual life situations. Like, nobody who's ever won a war won it by accident. They won it by strategy. Who had the best team, the best strategies, the best things? Nobody that won a basketball game, football, nobody who won anything did it by accident. It happens in preparation. And they're prepared to execute on whatever the plan is. And the same thing has to happen in our minds. We have to get a plan and we have to execute. Third reason, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 7, verse 22 to 23 says this, on the thought of the battleground in the mind. It says, with my whole heart, I agree with the law of God. But in every part of me, I discover something fighting against my mind, and it makes me a prisoner of sin that controls everything I do. This should give all of us some hope. 
Because we're sitting there and it's like, I'm trying to do right, but everything in me, listen, everything in this world is fighting against us doing what's right. Everything's attacking our mind. Everything's attacking our feelings. Everything's attacking our emotions because our feelings are trying to work to dictate our life and trying to pull us away from the things of God, trying to make us make decisions that are irreversible, trying to get us into places that we can't get out of. That's what the mind is trying to do. So listen, you're not the only one. You're not the only Christian in the room who has a fight in their mind. I know sometimes it can feel like that because when you talk to them, you know, some other Christians give you good advice and, or they look at you kind of like, oh, that's, you're dealing with that, oh, and they don't want to be acknowledged, the fact that they do too. Especially in, so I, 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 I'm in Albuquerque. They're a little more open with what they got going on. But when I was in North Dallas for five years, there was a church culture there that was very much, don't talk about it, don't say nothing, let's all just pretend that everything's great. I don't know what life you've lived, but a lot of times, my life isn't always great. Now, I choose to try to make it that way and try to see the positive and try to smile through the pain, but I don't, also don't pretend that it's always great. I think that's sometimes what we've lacked in the body of Christ is a realness because we come to Jesus and that's where he forgives us and gives us grace, but it doesn't end up making us perfect in and of ourselves. Only he is perfect. Sometimes we act like, oh, well, you know, we, we don't have no issues. And can I tell you something else? Not every little thing that happens to you is the devil. Amen. When, you, when you walked into church and your heel broke, it wasn't the devil trying to get you. <laughs> oh, I got a flat tire. That devil trying to get me. No, the nail did. <laughs> we give them way too much credit. I've heard people all the time, well, God wanted me to go through this. It's like, well, actually, your actions made you go through that. I was watching a documentary just recently of a famous professional athlete that something happened to him. And not happened to him. He did stuff, and something happened. Um, And it was just interesting to me, the verbiage. It was actually a, a Magic Johnson documentary. And if you remember back in the early 90s, he got AIDS. Um, HIV from being promiscuous. But his verbiage while I was watching the documentary, now I watch all sorts of sports documentaries because I love the mind of trying to be great at something and he had a drive for that, but he was just living a wild lifestyle. Well, he gets HIV through that. But his verbiage in it was, well, if God wanted me to go through this, I just had to go through it. And I'm like, did God want you to go through that or did your decisions make you go through that? God didn't give you HIV, bro. (laughs) He didn't. He didn't force you to be promiscuous. Whose choice was that? His. But we do that, and it sounds so like, yeah. It's like, no. I go through a lot of the crap I go through because I'm dumb sometimes. Because I don't have it all together. And that's where, thank God, the grace of Jesus can come in and help me and pull me through it and give me some hope that I can get through those bad decisions that I've made, that even if it has lasting, lifelong impact, God can still use me and do something through me. But God didn't put me through that. I put me through that. Sometimes we get like, well, why is God putting me through this? Is he, though, or is just life happening? Well, my washer and dryer broke. I started to tithe preacher, and then my washer and dryer broke. Man, God's testing me. No, your washer and dryer is testing you. (laughs) And then now it's a test of your heart for yourself. Are you still going to be obedient to God even when it's tight, even when it's painful? Will I obey God over what I feel like doing? We got to learn to act different than how we feel. Because most of you, I bet, you're at the late service, so I guarantee this was the case. You didn't get out of bed this morning when you felt like it. You got out of bed and then later you finally felt like it. Most people don't just get out of bed because they feel like, like, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't live in a movie. So I don't just wake up and I'm like, ah, everything's great. And just pop out of bed and I don't look all pretty. Yeah. Look a little rough. <laughs> you know, it just happens. But I get out of bed, not necessarily because I feel like it, but I get out of bed and then eventually I start to feel like it. Because if I went with my feelings, my bed is comfortable, it's nice and warm, I'm feeling good, I could just lay here. But I have to be disciplined enough to get my butt up and to go attack the day and dominate the day and not count the days, but make the days count. It's mental performance stuff. That's what we talk about. I got to make a decision to act different than how I feel. 
I got to become master of my emotions instead of my emotions mastering me. Because if we get out of control, then we get out of control and that's when bad things happen. Number three is the reason to, to, to work on our mind is that the mind is the key to peace. Romans chapter eight, verse six says this, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse four to five says this, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And this is what we have to do with our thoughts right here. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So when we get bad thoughts or we want to think about certain things or get to a certain place, we have to learn to take those thoughts captive and then replace them with God's truth. So here's three habits we can do. One is we've got to, I must feed my mind with truth. You, can't, you and I cannot overcome the thoughts of the enemy if we don't know the word of God. Because when the enemy tries to tell me you've blown it too much, you're this, you're that, you're this, I know the word of God enough to say, no, Jesus died for that. And I'm not that thing. I am a child of God. But I can't speak that if I don't know that. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, Jesus again says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So in order to take our thoughts captive and then replace them, we have to know the truth of the word of God. We have to apply the word of God and begin to speak it over ourselves. It's affirmations. People get weird about sometimes about affirmations, but I, I have my own affirmations list that I say over myself every single day, and it's things about who I want to be and who I am that are positive and good thoughts, such as I'm a committed father and husband. Such as, I am a one-moment warrior. I compete one moment at a time. I'm not too far in the past. I'm not too far in the future. I'm right where my feet are. I'm competing right now. Why? Because this is the only moment that I have any semblance of control over. Can't control what didn't happen, and I can't control what's about to happen, but I can control this. Because five minutes from now, you have no control. You don't even know what five minutes from now is going to hold. I mean, I am still might be talking. <laughs> But you, you, you don't know what I'm about to say because you can't control what's going to come out. Sometimes I feel like I can't, but it happens. It's fine. <laughs> God gives grace for those moments. But we have to learn to replace this stuff with the truth. The second thing we've got to do is I must free my mind from what is wrong because we have enemies. One, the first enemy we have is my flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I want you to see something. It says, what do they do? They set their minds. So we get to choose what we set our mind on, the flesh or the things of God. Do we set our minds on the things of the world or do we set them on the things of God? Our second enemy is my adversary, Satan. First John chapter 4, verse 4 says this, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And speaking of thoughts, because we've all had crazy ones, Martin Luther said this, You can't keep the birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair or lack thereof, if you're me. You can't control sometimes the thoughts that come to you, but you get to control if they stay. I get to control if they stay. I get to control if they build something inside of my brain. I get to control that. I get to speak to it and, and either give life to it or crush it and cap, take it captive and replace it with the thoughts of God. I get to choose that. Third thing is my society or the world's value system. First John chapter 2, verse 16 says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now here's what we can put in our mind. The, the, the next blank, number three, is I must focus my mind on what is right. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, which means think on these things. If we were to take an inventory of our thoughts, this is what God told us to think on. Within your marriage, with your kids, with your job, with your employer, with your employees, with whatever it is that you do, we have to learn to see what God sees. 
Because again, if all you see is, well, my spouse doesn't do this, they don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do this, you're never going to be happy. Here's the problem. Happiness doesn't matter because that changes because it's a feeling. I've had people tell me this all the time. Well, you know, sometimes I struggle with what if I would have married so-and-so or what if I would have went to this place or what if I would have done this or what if I would have had these kids or da 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 I don't know what would have happened, but that's a waste of your time and your energy. Because I do know this, if you don't commit to being all in on what you do have, this isn't going to go well. Because you can't go back and change who you're going to marry. And Can I say something else? If you're in a marriage, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I've been talking about marriage and didn't mean to, but I guess you guys have this incredible marriage thing coming up, so it's just the Spirit of God trying to say this is important. But if you tell me... <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know it's you know it's gonna be crazy. No, it's not. I just know how it sits. But if you're always questioning your spouse's judgment, oh, their judgment's so bad. Everything they do, I don't, I don't trust their judgment. Well, they married you. <laughs> so if their judgment sucks, what does that say? <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> So if their judgment's that bad, well, then they must have really made a bad decision when they married you, so stop saying it. Stop saying it. I know it kind of can sound harsh, but I don't care again. Um, because it's true. And here's what I know. You're not perfect either, so stop. Stop. It, the world is so much more full of critics than performers. How about you do everything you know to do, and then you can say something? But last time I checked, not a single one of us operates exactly like the Bible tells us to operate. So make allowances for other stuff. Now, there are some things that are egregious. If someone's hitting you, beating you, that's a whole different thing. You need to, you need to protect yourself and get out of that situation. But if it's just irreconcilable differences because you don't know how to get along, can I tell you something? You ain't going to get along with the next spouse either. You know why? Because you're still going to be you. <laughs> so until you fix you with God's help, nothing's going to change. So me look into the next thing. Be all in with what you got. Make it work if you can with what you've got. And the Bible says as much as it's on you... Be at peace with all men. So do everything that you can. So let me do a little exercise and then we'll close. I'm going to ask you to do something physical. And you're going to stay seated, but it's just physical. It's not super hard. But I'm going to ask that before I have you do it, I need a commitment from everyone that you're going to give me your very best effort. Yes? Will you give me your best effort? Okay. I only heard like three people. So, okay. Okay. So in a minute, not yet, but when I say, I'm going to have you raise your right hand as high as you can. If you can't raise your right hand, raise your left hand. If you can't do either, just, just watch and participate that way. But when I say go, when I say go, not yet, I'm going to ask everyone to raise your right hand as high as you can get it. Stay in seated, but raise it as high as you can get it. Then I'm going to have you stop and just hold it there, okay? So when I say go, you're going to hold it. You're going to get it as high as you can, and then you're just going to stop, okay? Best effort. Ready? One, two, three, go. Get it up there. All right, now stop. Now everybody give me a quarter inch more, just a little bit more. Why did all those hands just move up? You can put them down. You can put them down. Why, when I asked for a quarter inch more, did everyone's hand go? Y'all lied to me. You told me you are going to give me your best effort. You told yourself that that was your very best. Sometimes we say, I gave my best effort, but did you? There's always a little bit more left in the tank. There's always a little bit more that we could do, even if it's that quarter inch. So what's that quarter inch more you can do for your spouse? What's that quarter inch more you can do with your kids, with your church, with your job? What's that quarter inch more? Because we always lie to ourselves and say, oh, I gave my best, but did we? Because here's what I found. I always have a quarter inch more. Even when I say, I did give my best. I always had something left. Unless I'm literally playing a basketball game and I, they have to drag me off the court. But last time I checked, if you watch an NBA game, 
other than the one time Michael Jordan was sick with the flu and Scottie Pippen was carrying him off the court, most of those guys still walk off or run off the court to the locker room, which means there was still a little bit of juice left. We always tell ourselves, I'm gonna give my best. Now, if I did this exercise again, and I asked you to give me six inches more, you're like, okay, that's a lot. I don't know that I could do that. Well, you could if you stood up on the chair. There's always a way to find more. There's always a new strategy. There's always something. This world and life and the word of God has answers, but we have to be willing to look for them, and then after we find them, we have to apply them. You don't need a whole lot more Bible until you start applying what you already know. People tell me all the time, preacher, I I wish we could get deeper into some things. And I'm like, dude, you don't even do the Jesus died on the cross part right yet. Like, if you're not even consistently attending church, why do I need to give you anything else? (laughs) That's for my CEO Christians, you know, the Christmas and Easter only. That's what I call them. They're my CEOs. <laughs> Jesus loves me too, y'all. I'll, I'll close with this story because I heard this story about an old farmer recently. And this farmer was super discouraged with his farm. He hated it. He hated the whole thing. He just, it was awful. So he finally was fed up with it. So he called a realtor and said, Hey, I want to list my farm for sale. Can you come look at it, take the pictures, and then make a listing? And so the realtor comes and does all that. And after a, a little bit of them making the listing, he came back to the, the realtor came back to the farmer and said, okay, I want your approval. Make sure you're good with what I'm saying about the property. He begins to read to the farmer the listing, and it says, man, this, this farm is in a great location. It's got a well-maintained house, sturdy barns, lush pasture lands, a beautiful pond, fertile soil, and great views. So the farmer listens carefully, and he hears that, and he says, hey, wait a minute, stop real quick. Can you say that? Read that and say that back to me again, but super slowly this time. So the realtor goes back to the listing and says, okay. And he he says, man, it's in a great location. It's a well-maintained house, sturdy barns, lush pasture lands, a beautiful pond, fertile soil, and great views. The farmer's kind of sitting there, and he looks up, and he looks at the realtor, and he says, you know what? I've changed my mind. I'm not going to sell this place anymore. I've always been looking for a place like that. The grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it and tend to it. You and I are going to get what we see. If our focus is on all the negative and our thoughts are always on the bad things and this and that, that's what we're going to get. But we've got to learn to take our thoughts in captive and subject and begin to do what the Bible says, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, maybe with your spouse, you need to just find the any, if there's anything good that they do. If, because obviously, you were attracted to him, married to him for something. They were good at something. There is, if there's any virtue in your spouse, if there's any virtue in your church, if there's any virtue in your job, if there's any virtue in your kids, think about those things. Find the good. We're trained and conditioned because of sin to always find the bad, the negative. That's why we love the the TV shows we love, drama, That's why some of us can't live without chaos going on around us so our mouths are always on other people. Listen to me. I don't like hanging out with people that are always talking about other people. I like talking about being around people that are talking about greatness. Because if you're talking about other people, you're trying to belittle it or make yourself feel better. Listen, Jesus didn't die so that you could talk about someone else. He died so that you could fix you because he died so you could be great. And nobody else has to get smaller for you to be great. You're good enough. You have your own gifts and skills and talents. But if you're too busy looking at everything else, you're never going to see it. You have a 50-year marriage inside of you. You have kids who love Jesus inside of you. They're in your homes. 
You have a church. You have, a, you have it in you. But you have to be willing to see it and think on it and find it and fight for it. We got to get some grit. We got to get some toughness. We got to get something about us that says, I don't care what's trying to fight with me. I don't care what's coming in. I'm going to take authority of it. I'm going to take responsibility for myself. And I'm going to see God do something great. We've got to get there. We've got to get there. Because that's what Jesus did. He looked at you. He said, yeah, you're a little messy. But I love you. Yeah, you got some issues, but I'm still going to leave my perfection for you because you're worth dying for. You're not too far gone. You're not too messy for me, and I'm not scared of your mess. Matter of fact, bring your mess to me, and I'll clean it up. That's what Jesus did on the cross. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me. If you're in here and you say, preacher, one, I've, for me to start this, I need to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you've never met Jesus before. Say, so, preacher, would you introduce me to Jesus today? I want to give him my life. I want to ask him to forgive me of my sin and to give me a new future and a new hope that I could have eternal life in heaven and not hell. If that's you, or maybe you've given him your life before, but you've walked away and you say, today I want to recommit my life to Jesus. I want to ask him to come back into my life to help me. From this day forward, I'm going to walk with him. Or maybe you just, you're in this place where you say, preacher, I honestly don't know if I'm good with God. If God forbid I was to leave this earth, I don't know whether I'd be going to heaven or hell. And so today I want to make sure that I'm right with God and that I give him my life and that my eternal destination would be secure in heaven. If that's you and you're in either one of those three places, I'm not going to call you forward or embarrass you in any way. I simply want to know who I'm praying with. But if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, Right where you're at, if you would, just raise your hand if there's anybody in here at all. It says, preacher, include me. Thank you, 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 I see those hands. Thank you, I see this hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. I'm going to look across one more time. If something inside of you is prompting you, that's the Spirit of God saying, this is your time, this is your moment. You don't have to clean it up to come to him. You just come to him right as you are, and he begins to clean us up. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask that you would do me a favor. I'm going to ask that you would repeat this prayer aloud after me so you can hear your own voice. More importantly, I'm going to ask that you'd believe it in your heart. For those of you in this place that Jesus is already your Lord and Savior. If you would also pray this out loud in support of those who raise their hand. If everybody would, say, Father, I come to you now seeking salvation. So right now, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. That you sent him to die on the cross for my sin and that you raised him from the grave. So Jesus, I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sin and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me and guide me in all your ways and all your truth. In Jesus' name.